Yep. Good evening. Our sign language interpreter is Yulan Zale. Now, detectives have arrested 10 suspects believed to be behind a spate of break-ins in Nairobi and its environs. The police say the suspects in their custody were arrested in a joint operation following investigations into several cases of robbery with violence and murder reported by affected victims. And as our crimes reporter, Franklin Walla, now reports, Citizen TV managed to retrieve crucial CCTV footage under scrutiny as part part of evidence in some of the reported cases. This CCTV footage recorded on Sunday the 11th of August 2024 captured a five-man gang alighting from a car and entering a go-down along the eastern bypass in Nairobi. The suspects are said to have staged a four-hour robbery. Security guards at the premise say they were threatened and tied with the ropes as the five-man gang rained terror on them. After close to five hours of violence, suspects are said to have stolen goods of unknown value and packaged them ready for transportation. Moments later, the private motor vehicle used by the suspects to get to the crime scene was driven away by one of the suspects, probably to alert a standby driver to get set for the next task. In less than 10 minutes, the accomplices arrived driving a blue counter ready to transport the stolen goods. Witnesses say the suspects loaded stolen items onto the counter and drove to an unknown destination. Police were called in, but it was already too late. As per statements from the go-down attendants, items stolen on this day include oil and lubricants. Other similar incidences under investigation were reported on diverse dates of April and July 2024. In all the incidents, the suspects are said to have stolen goods running into millions of shillings. In other instances, they killed their victims. A similar incident was reported at a go-down in Mwinki and Kamul where the gang, using the same mode as operandi, stole goods of unknown value in go-downs. In the Kamul robbery, one security guard was maimed and killed before suspects made away with several cartons of nails and barbed wires. Mm. Following these cases, detectives arrested a 10-man gang believed to be behind the reported break-ins. As such, at one of the suspects' house within Murera in Georgia, saw the recovery of more than 400 cartons of products believed to be proceeds of crime. Investigators from Nairobi area crime branch who are profiling the suspects also recovered four motor vehicles connected to the go-down break-ins. All the 10 suspects are currently detained at Kasarani Police Station, awaiting court process come Friday. Franklin Wala, Citizen TV. Now to another story. Police Inspector General nominee Douglas Kanja was put to task by members of parliament over the excessive use of force by the police in recent Gen Z-led protests. The Joint Security Committees of the Senate and the National Assembly that were weighing his suitability to hold the office of the IG questioned him over how parliament was invaded under the watch of the National Police Service on the 25th of June this year. Kanja, who has served in various ranks within the police service for close to four decades, said he would ensure the police service operates within the confines of the law should his appointment be approved. Safin Acheng Omar now reports. Hi, Douglas Kanja Kirocha. The Inspector General of Police nominee Douglas Kanja found himself in a tight spot before the Joint Security Committees of the National Assembly and the Senate legislators questioning the police response to the recent Gen Z-led protests against the government. Do you think the police service has complied or has been complying to the provisions, especially when managing protests? If there is excessive use of force by an officer. We have the oversight bodies. We have IPOA. We have the ODPP. And even now, as you speak, I know there are several investigations that are ongoing in relation to what happened uh, during the demonstrations. There is a clear demonstration that uh, any use of excessive force cannot be around and it cannot go unpunished. Kanja had pressed to also explain how the invasion of parliament was executed under his watch by demonstrators who also touched City Hall on the 25th of June 2024. How comes that uh, such thing could happen and uh, you could not even have the basic 
fire engines or water even to put off the fire. Were you pleased, IG nominee, with the invasion of parliament? No, that was one of the worst moments in my life. And if approved and appointed IG, I will do whatever it takes to ensure that this parliament is safe and secure. And on the controversy surrounding the deployment of Kenyan police officers to Haiti. The officers on deployment, they are, they are doing a very good job. They have been received well by the people of Haiti. Loads have been opened. Hostels have been opened. The ports have been opened. The airport has actually been opened. Kanja has an extensive career having joined the service as a police constable in 1985, rising through the ranks of the National Police Service. He was serving as Deputy Inspector General of Police before he was named the acting IG following the resignation of Jafet Koome on July 12, 2024. He has served as the commandant of the General Service Unit for five years and as deputy commandant of the GSU for three years. If approved to be the IG of the National Police Service, I will ensure that the service performs its duties within the frameworks of the law. Safin Acheng Oma, citizen, TV. Families of victims of police brutality during recent anti-government protests are still demanding action from the authorities. The families whose kin are still nursing injuries in hospitals want the Independent Policing Oversight Authority to speed up investigations and bring to account the officers responsible. Brenda Wanga spoke to one such family from Mulalongo whose son was shot in the abdomen. In slow, measured pace, Daniel Maura puts one foot in front of the other, learning once again to walk in the midst of pain, both physical and mental. One month ago, he had a near-death experience. Imagine. <laughs> Daniel was barely two days old in the city, having just come from upcountry to try his luck when he was inadvertently caught in the crossfire between youthful anti-government protesters and the armed police officers in Kitengela Center. <laughs> The police officer's bullet caught him in the abdomen, a fact that did not register to him at first. Mm. But he soon found out how badly injured he was. Doctors at the hospital rest against time to stop his bleeding and restore his exposed internal organs. Um, from the initial assessment, uh, he was shot from the side. So the bullet came in from the top uh, left-hand side, uh, perforating the intestines, uh, perforating the large intestine, fractured the uh, pelvis, and was lodged in the right hip. So it was fortunate to be in a sideways direction, uh, missing the major blood vessels that were opposed. The doctors say the bullet had lodged in his body as it had no exit wound. During the operation to repair his ruptured abdomen, it was retrieved and is in the custody of the family who now want to know who shot their son and when that person will be held accountable. The Independent Policing Oversight Authority, when asked this very question, cited frustrations in the ongoing investigations. On the forensic and ballistics, it is possible if you can assign the bullet to the gun and the blood to the individual. And that gun, really, if it's an AK-47, 
uh, you must narrow down to that AK-47. Uh, in this case, we had officers from different police stations, all of them probably having the same kind of a gun. And uh, you need to get that bullet and match it to a specific gun. So the kind of uh, scenario we are dealing with now is not as easy as it has been presented. IPOA promises to pursue other measures to bring officers to account, including holding police commanders responsible. Brenda Wanga, Citizen TV. Now to the Olympics, and all 11 Kenyan Olympic medalists have been awarded cash prizes of between 1 million shillings and 3 million shillings in a welcoming ceremony in the new city of Eldred. President William Ruto, who presided over the ceremony, also announced that all Kenyan participants in the 2024 Olympics will receive a cash appreciation of 200,000 shillings each. Citizen TV sports editor Mike Okini witnessed the celebrations that began with the procession into the city of champions. Team Kenya members from the Paris Olympic Games arrived in Eldoret early morning in two batches. The first batch arrived on board a Kenya Airways flight, while the second smaller group arrived in a military plane. They were received at the airport by local leaders and traditional dancers. <laughs> The athletes then made their way to the Eldoret State Lodge for the recognition and awards ceremony. Before going for the Olympic Games, the team captains received the flag from President William Ruto. The team returned the flag with goodies, 11 medals in total, 4 gold, 2 silver and 5 bronze medals. The team maintained the top spot in Africa and 17th position worldwide despite the pressure from Kenyans who demanded medals from the opening day. Ranked well above many hugely endowed global nations and truly fought a good fight to keep our flag high. NOC President Paul Tergat asked the president to host federations who are suffering with no permanent home. Most of our federations, they don't have any physical offices and it could, it would, it could go a long way if they could be given office space at our national st stadiums, which uh, we have, and especially at Nyayo and Kasarani. New Sports Cabinet Secretary Kipchumba Murkomen says there is a lot of untapped talent in Kenya, but the problem is in the federations. Athletes are suffering in training with no proper training facilities. Murkomen assured that the government will be fully involved in investing in athletes' preparations before major games. There is a lot of hard work, waking up in the morning, beating your body, denying yourself food, denying yourself pleasure, denying yourself your family. If you go to training camps, these athletes are sleeping on a very small bed, you know. Standards and expectations have been set very high. President Ruto says a sports policy framework is being developed to safeguard Kenya's space in sports as other countries are closing in in Kenya's traditional races. We all know why we have five, we have four gold medals. Because the fifth gold medal on steeplechase is missing. <laughs> Mr. Murkomen. <laughs> 25 academies in 25 counties are being designed by TVETs and the construction will start soon. The academies will be purely for nurturing talents and will be funded by the sports fund. A victory that cements his status. The president has once again reiterated that the sports fund will be purely for sporting activities and nothing else. This is a bold move that will ensure that the funds go into developing sports in the country. Michael Kinyi for Citizen TV in Eldoret, Wasengishu County. Now, the management, or rather, Eldred City will now join the League of Other Cities in the country, becoming the fifth to attain that status. President William Ruto, while handing over the charter in Eldred, said the new city will now have to be relook, uh, will now have to relook into its roads and other infrastructure to attract investment and enable the locals enjoy city standards. Stephen Leto reports. <laughs> And color decorated the handing of the charter to the Eldoret city. Though the ceremony was largely legal and led by head of public service Felix Koske and Solicitor General Shadrak Mose, the excitement was palpable. The height of the event being the presidential proclamation of the new city. I, 
Kipchirchir, William Samoei Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander-in-Chief of Kenya's Defense Forces, do hereby ordain, declare, and direct that the municipality of Eldred has been conferred with city status. The Eldoret Municipal Board initiated the process of elevating Eldoret to a city status, a process that ended up in the Senate with the Senate Committee on Devolution and Intergovernmental Relations giving the push a clean bill of health. The committee said the town meets the criteria set out in Section 5 of the Urban Areas and Cities Act 2011. Under the revised Act, an urban establishment requires to meet a threshold of 250,000 people in population, a criteria which the new city met with the statistics from the Kenya National Bureau of Standards showing Eldoret urban population stood at 475,716 people. Eldoret was ranked as the fifth most populous urban areas after Nairobi, Nakuru, Mombasa and Roiru. <laughs> Now being a city, Eldoret will be required to sustain the status by sourcing of its own revenue, a requirement it has always met for being the county with the highest collection 990 million shillings in 2023. Eldoret City will now benefit from equitable funding to cities to finance critical infrastructure such as roads, sewerage and airports. It will also be placed under a long-term sustainable economic growth and will be collaborating with other cities in the world on development, mainly through enhanced public-private partnerships. It's an emotional moment for me. Uh, I rarely do this, but this is home. Stephen Leto, Citizen TV. All right, and just before we begin our conversation with the panelists that are already here in studio, let's just walk through uh, the process of a municipality becoming a city. And we start by looking at the decision that would have to be taken by a municipality board, which has to uh, pass the resolution on what should happen uh, by determining that uh, indeed it has become a city. Um, after that, that is referred to the committee or the county executive committee um, that uh, considers the decision of the board. After that, uh, the county governor, if the CEC, that is the cabinet of the county, has approved, the county governor informs and fo forms a, an ad hoc team uh, to check whether uh, the municipality meet, meets the criteria for becoming a city. If the answer is yes, then the governor will transmit that decision to the county assembly. Uh, then the county assembly will consider and if it agrees, the county assembly a clerk refers that matter to the Senate. The Senate clerk then, once the Senate has decided that indeed it meets the pre-qualification uh, considerations, uh, then writes to the president for confirmation of the city status. And today we've seen the president of the republic um, conferring that status on the city. So with us this evening, we have uh, Senator Moses Kajuang, who is the senator of Homer Bay. We have Juliet uh, Rieta, oh, sorry, Juliet Rita. Uh, and also we have Philip Kiss, who is the former town clerk of the city of Nairobi. Let's begin with you, Senator, and talk to us about that entire process, because the last time we heard of this um, is when the devolution conference was happening in Eldred, and you saw some senators going there to uh, check uh, the status of that. Maybe you can just help us walk through uh, that process quickly and what the Senate considered to say that they are satisfied that Eldred indeed uh, deserves that status. Uh, thank you, Sam. I was the chair of the devolution committee in the last parliament that approved the confirmment of city status uh, on Nakuru municipality. And I'm very happy to see that uh, Eldoret, which is a town uh, that I went to college, I went to Mo University, uh, the municipality has now been elevated into a city. What people might not um, get clearly is that it's not the entire Eldoret county that has become a city. It is the municipality that has been elevated to a city. And the municipality covers about 150 square kilometers and excludes the international airport. So if you're living in Keses or you're living in Chebkoelel, you're not in the city. It is a municipality that has been upgraded. Now the process as has been listed there, it's quite rigorous. At the beginning, 
you will find that uh, the county government has to set up an, a task force that has planners, that has architects, that has lawyers, that has got various professionals to assess the readiness of the municipality to become a city. That then goes into the county assembly. That then comes to the Senate. The Senate does public participation. And once the Senate makes a decision on it, it's transmitted to the president and the president grants a charter. It's a fairly straightforward uh, process. And some, I want to urge municipality managers across the country to aspire to become cities. For example, there's Ruiru municipality that is just next door to Nairobi. You know, there's no reason why uh, you don't have a city there. Okay. Uh, there's no reason why you don't have a city in places like Meru, ETC, because the criteria, the threshold is fairly low. All it's right. a population consideration of 250,000. And mm -hmm. I think many of our municipalities, or quite a number of our municipalities, can qualify right. to become cities. Uh, all right. J Juliet, t tell us what should be the basic description um, or qualities of an area to become a city, away from the law, um, that citizens would say that when I look at this, indeed, it is qualifying to be a city. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the basic of it is the services. What are the citizens getting? Because um, I don't think you can go to the ground and people will say they're in a city if they're not getting services. Yeah? And that's something that we look on our end as urban planners and um, also professionals in the built environment to make sure that a city, once it's getting, or once it is considered to be a city, it has the necessary services to support the functions of a city. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of the economic or the revenue function of the city. Okay, and Philip, you've run a city. Um, what for you must take? Well, um, let me join my colleagues in, uh, first of all, congratulating Eldoret uh, for being elevated from a municipality to a city. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a landmark, and uh, I'm happy for the people who come from that particular area. Uh, already, uh, Senator Kajuang must be having his own biases because he went to school in Eldoret, <laughs> and therefore, there's no doubt that, uh, uh, you know, he has a soft spot for uh, Eldoret. Um, uh, municipality. Now, but you see, um, in determining um, what becomes a city, it is clearly spelled out in Schedule 1 of the Urban, um, Urban Areas and Cities mm -hmm. Act of <coughs> 2019, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, I think, Section 5, 9, and 10. That's where you find um, um, the specifications that will lead into an area being um, conferred a city status. Right. Now, for Eldoret, of course, it meets, for me, it meets one criteria. That is the population, 250, and is above 250. But then when you look at the other aspects that are required for a city, uh, things, uh, you know, infrastructure that will support um, uh, running of the city, I doubt whether it has met the threshold. Okay. Um, and therefore, um, I mean, we probably now, uh, as, as, as a government, and uh, Senator Kajuang is part of it, is part of the Senate, they now need to start pushing for cities to have funding. Okay. Because you can't just call, you can't just call an area a city, and that area does not have necessary infrastructure to support um, running of that uh, uh, city. All right, there are many Philip, things. Um, we'll get to that. We'll, 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 we'll get to that. But, yes, um, we'll get to the details of. But uh, uh, let me say this, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Sam. Yeah. Um, I would have expected them to come out very clearly and say what sort of a city mm -hmm. is Eldoret. Because if you look at uh, Boston, for example, Boston is known because of the university, the, the universities that are there. So Eldoret probably should be a sports city, okay. and that is what we should be promoting. All right. We'll get to the details of that later with the panel here in studio. But first, Eldred Municipality Management was forced to remove the statues, or statues of two athletes from the streets of the now fifth city after heavy backlash from the public who ridiculed the structures as embarrassing while the leadership of the city says that the statues were donated by stakeholders under the advertisement and publicity arrangement. They admit they were also flabbergasted by the work they saw on the streets. And as Emmanuel Toh now reports, the statues were removed in the dead of the night. They say art, just like love, lies in the eyes of the beholder.
But Wednesday night, the glory of an Eldoret-based artist was short-lived as an uproar from a majority of Kenyans deemed the dream he had to have his work of art on display in the country's newest city, the city of Eldoret. The artist, who has characteristically kept a low profile, as many globally acclaimed artists do, had in his own eyes gone over and beyond to impress the visitors with a new look state of the art statues that would have been the face of the city of champions. 1,000 families from Nduru area in Kisumu are now calling for the setting up of dikes around Lake Victoria in order to caution them from the effects of perennial floods. The residents who have been in evacuation camps since April decried negligence from government, claiming they are yet to receive the compensation funds for victims of flooding as promised by the president. Laura Otieno now reports on the plight of the families who are still facing the threat of displacement as water levels in Lake Victoria continue to rise. At this site in Duru area, Nyando, Kisumu County, 53-year-old Helen Anyango organizes her stock. For the last three months, the mother of four has been selling firewood in order to sustain her children. Anyango is among the 100 families who have been at this camp for the last three months. After the raging flood waters chased her from her home in the dead of night. With her farm completely submerged, Anyango now does manual jobs to feed her family. <laughs> In one of the makeshift tents, some children are engaging in holiday tuition to compensate for the time lost during the second term. According to the area chief, more than 1,000 families from Nduru, Kaviambo and Ugwe villages are still displaced as water lodged by the backflow from Lake Victoria is yet to recede. Despite the directive by the Ministry of Interior banning all settlements within 30 meters of river lines and lake shores, residents here said the directive might be a tall order. Kwa nice option. Victoria, Hiko. until then, the residents here live from hand to mouth. Even so, they still await the compensation promised by the president to flood victims before their hopes drown in the ever-rising water levels. Laura Otieno, Citizen TV. Waipa leader Kalonzo Mosioka has softened his hardline stance on the broad-based government and his sharp criticism of Raila Odinga's collaboration with President William Ruto. Kalonzo now emphasizes his willingness to engage with Raila Odinga to strengthen the Azimio coalition and says he is determined to forge a powerful alliance to challenge for the presidency in 2027. Melita Oletengues reports. Once they get back to their seats. Kalonzo Musioka finds himself navigating treacherous political waters as Raila Odinga's growing rapport with President Ruto continues to solidify. Once staunchly opposed to ODM's cabinet nominations, Kalonzo's position has evolved. Today he signals a shift in stance. You see, we must continue to engage with uh, Raila Odinga is, uh, as we speak, the leader of Azmio La Umoja One Kenya coalition. There's no way we'll not engage with him going forward. Um, and so that is to be expected until, until we, we come to a decision on whether to release him to go completely to African Union. Amid speculation about his next move and ongoing rifts within the Azimio coalition, Kalonzo is gearing up to challenge Ruto in the 2027 elections. He believes a new political alignment is crucial for mounting a successful campaign. The idea is to form 
a coalition that will not only drive Kenya kwanza home mapema but I'm quite sure if we are in this country today if there was an election there'll be no Kenya kwanza Speaking at the Oslo Center Africa Youth Forum, Kalonzo addressed Gen Z-led anti-government protests, advocating for youth inclusion in national dialogue and calling for justice for victims of the protests. Kuna wazazi bada wajui watoto wao wakomocha rigani. Ava tukizungumza, hawajui. Niliona mze moja kizima, I want my son dead or alive. The Africa Youth Forum highlighted that Kenya has become a model in the region for championing constitutional rights and democracy. Use Kenya as a model, so you became the model and you are to die. We have developed the Youth Assembly program in Kenya for Kenyan youths. Alonzo indicated that an Azimio Council meeting chaired by former President Uhuru Kenyatta is in the offing to sort out issues bedeviling the coalition. Milita Oletenges, Citizen TV, Nairobi. Now, the High Court has ordered the government to stop the implementation and enforcement of the uh, revised road maintenance levy until a case filed against the government and three other respondents is hard and determined. The imposed fuel levy on petroleum products, that is diesel and super petrol, of 25 shillings per litre up from 18 shillings per litre came into effect on 15th of July 2023. The petitioner, George Odiambo uh, Juma, moved to court arguing that the road maintenance levy is an Unconstitutional, illegal, and unreasonable. The court on Thursday has ordered the government to stop implementing and enforcing the levy fund until a case is heard and determined on the 28th of August 2024. The Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority hiked the levy from 18 shillings to 25 shillings at a time when the country is grappling with challenges of high cost of living. Former Transport Cabinet Secretary Kipchuma Murukomen gazetted the levy on the 10th of July 2024, a day after he assured Kenyans that the over Overwhelming concerns from Kenyans during the public participation stage would be considered. All right, that levy came to effect on the 15th of July 2024, not 23, as I indicated there. But uh, back to the conversation about cities, uh, with the country now talking about five cities. Philip, you had gotten to the point of saying that um, when you look at the qualifying um, characteristics, you do not see Eldred meeting those. What exactly are you talking about? You know, I think if you look at the uh, um, urban areas and uh, cities as uh, act, it's very clear. I think they pinpoint two areas specifically. One is the issue of population, two, the issue of infrastructure. So in terms of population, of course, Eldoret, uh, as it is, meets the threshold. I doubt whether the Senate, it is, it is in, it's, in its own wisdom, um, found that uh, the city, as it is now, met all the criteria as set in the, uh, in the Act. But the other two issues that I would want to bring up, Number one, uh, and, uh, the third one that, that should have been considered, and I think it is mentioned in the Act, the issue of systems. Um, does that particular area have uh, adequate and sufficient systems to support uh, management of that area as a city? The other thing is, of course, that can be, uh, you know, that can be inbuilt is the issue of uh, human capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, in their wisdom, uh, the Senate didn't look, 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 look at those issues that are not clearly spelled out in the, in the Act, but are necessary yeah. uh, to run a proper city. So Otherwise, is it so bad or it's work in progress? It, it can be corrected? We can correct. Okay. We can correct. So I'm, I'm not saying that we should deny an area, mm -hmm. a city status, because they are running short of certain uh, aspects of what is required in right. running and operating um, a city. But I think what I'm saying is that the Senate and the government, because the Senate are the custodians of um, the uh, devolved governments, the Senate should now push very, very hard to have one, a fund to specifically support the cities.
because cities in this country, mm -hmm. in fact, all over the world, bear the burden of the economy. Now that the city, uh, Eldoret has been pronounced as a city, there are so many expectations that will be um, lumped onto Eldoret. And we've already seen from your own uh, presentation that Eldoret is currently, or in fact, not the Eldoret, but was thinking she's collecting about a billion shillings. Mm -hmm. I doubt whether a billion shillings can run a city, uh, you know, can meet. Yet the one billion is for the entire county. You see, it's, it's, it's one, just... billion, one billion yeah. is um, 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 revenues collected by the, by, by, by the city, mm -hmm. one billion shillings. Mm -hmm. But I doubt whether that is adequate. So this city, we are calling it a city, but for it to operate at optimum levels, they will have to have sufficient support from, from the center of the national government. Mm. Currently, there is no county other than probably Nairobi, Kisumu, and maybe Mombasa, who generate sufficient, not sufficient, but a reasonable amount of revenue yeah. to support their own operations. Okay. So if you pull out the money that comes from the national government, all the counties will collapse. What I'm saying is that um, the Senate and the government, they need to start building capacity in terms of revenue collection, in terms of manpower, so that they can operate optimally. All right. Yeah. And Senator, I'll get to you, Juliet, but Senator, so the Senate was satisfied as what are the institutions that are lined up in the, in, the, in the law and what needs to happen. But on the questions he's raising about capacity, but also the financing, what should happen now? Sam, the score was not 100%. And we all know that uh, with an 80% in Kenya, you, it's, it's a first class. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, for example, in the report of the Senate, Eldoret does not have a museum. And so we made a recommendation that a museum be established. In the case of Nakuru, Nakuru did not have an airport. Uh, you know, Nakuru County does not have a, a, a proper commercial airport. But uh, we give them the benefit of doubt because there are these airstrips in Lanet and a lot of private uh, airstrips within Nakuru. Mm -hmm. And we argued that should you wait for a municipality to meet all the criteria for you to grant them city status, or should you grant them city status as you push them mm -hmm. to build the capacity? Now, the advantage of the approach of granting them uh, the status and push them to build the capacity is once you become a city, then the city management and board can come up with a new valuation role that is specific to the city. Now, with a new valuation role, you can charge an extra tariff because of the services that people are getting from the city. Mm -hmm. But if it is still run as a municipality or it's still run as a town, it becomes very difficult to differentiate the valuation role. Okay. It becomes very difficult to differentiate uh, the, the, the tariff or uh, taxes. And that is usually one of the areas where when we do public participation, people resist the establishment of cities because they realize that once a city is established, the rates and tariffs might go up because there's demand for services. Yes. But it's a, it's a give and take. Some, the rate of urbanization, I think uh, uh, Rita will tell us perhaps 50% uh, will be in urban areas by 2030, if not 2050. But what kind of towns, what kind of cities are we building? Right. South Africa, yeah. uh, or, or Nigeria, let's take Nigeria. Nigeria decided that for every state, for each of their 36 states, there would be a capital city. Mm. So they've built a city for each state. Why can't we build a city for each county that we have in Kenya so that we've got properly planned, modern, urban enclaves in each city for a boy you know, to come from Fangano Island, where I come from. They don't have to run to Nairobi to Tamak. Mm. They can go to Home Bay City or okay. go to Kisumu City. Right. That should be the vision that we are selling to our youngsters. And Juliet, if I don't know if you have had the opportunity to interact with how different Nakuru looks right now, because it's been a city for how many years now? Because I think it was conferred the status by President Uhuru Kenyatta. So it's been more than two years. Three years now. Yeah. Three. What would you say has changed over that time, especially when it comes to service delivery, but also what citizens have to part with to finance the same? Well, um, that's an interesting comparison because uh, once you look at Nakuru as a city and how uh, now we are looking at Eldoret, uh, the functionality of the two cities is quite different. Um, the advantage or um, the opportunity that I see in Eldoret per se is that already we have an, quite a number of industries already. Uh, we do have quite a lot in terms of the critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. though not coordinated as such. Yeah? Going back to Eldoret, uh, to Nakuru, sorry, is um, 
we've seen quite a lot of investment going into uh, trying to organize infrastructure as it is, especially in the CBD. But still, a lot needs to be done in terms of providing the critical infrastructure to the to the larger areas. Yeah, right. uh, we still lack a lot of basic infrastructure like water, sewerage, um, street lighting, proper solid waste management. Uh, we have to. I think one of the things that especially touches um, my heart is the lack of that initiative to do proper solid waste management, not just connecting waste and putting it aside. Mm -hmm. And also looking at infrastructure as something which is uh, coordinated because you cannot do uh, just roads without looking, say, at walking and cycling infrastructure, which is commendable what Nakuru is doing in terms of walking and, and cycling. But also now you see the disconnect with public transportation. So that um, proper integration of all this infrastructure and services, that's something that is still lacking. Okay. And it's the basis that, uh, as I said in my first uh, opening remarks, once you have services, then it's easy also to go back and tell people, now I need to charge you more. Right. Um, but also, uh, the city, as the uh, Senate has alluded, once you get the status of a city, then you're able to uh, review how much you charge for basic services, your valuation roles, all those are opportunities that then again you have for raising your revenue so that again you're able to provide uh, services. Okay. Thank and you. of course we'll be getting into the details of what more you need to show for you to be conferred the city status, including the potential that you can actually have an international airport, a national stadium, a constituent university campuses, polytechnic training institutions, and so many more that are contained in the schedule guiding this. And of course, it might help you to assess whether your nearby municipality can actually become a city in the near future. But first, police in Mlolongo are investigating an incident where a businessman lost 1.7 million shillings to a gang targeting people withdrawing large amounts of money from banks. A daring move captured on CCTV shows how the businessman was trailed from a bank along Mombasa Road to Siokima, where the a group broke into his car and took away the cash stored in a safe inside the boat. This CCTV footage captures the moments before the theft of 1.7 million shillings from a car belonging to a businessman in Siokimau area. In the CCTV, a personal vehicle, registration number KDG 814J, believed to have been trailing the businessman from Mombasa Road arrives outside a school compound. One of the occupants gets out and walks towards the apartment where the businessman had parked his vehicle. The man in a white t-shirt and white shoes who had alighted to check on the businessman is captured going back to the car. The car then returns and parks outside the school gate and the same man comes out and walks towards the apartment. At one point, the driver steps out and signals two men. One comes and gets into the vehicle, while the other engages the driver before getting into the car. The man then steps out talking on phone and comes back. The driver leaves and walks towards the apartment, followed by another man. The man dressed in white t-shirt and shoes is seen going back to the car. He is seen monitoring to ensure there are no surprises. After about two minutes, one man returns to the car and leaves again in a hurry. The vehicle moves a few meters before two men come carrying something, and they all get in the vehicle and drive off. <laughs> The businessman whom we will conceal his identity for security reasons suspects that he could have been trailed by the gang from a bank at Samia Business Park along Mombasa Road when he went to withdraw the cash. One of the suspects in a white t-shirt and white shoes was spotted at the bank when he went to withdraw the money. He was also captured on CCTV near the apartment. 
mpaka kwa hapo kando yangu so wakati wamefikiwa na ile namba yake yenye wao wanaita pale kwa benki wakati watu wa mikiu uja mwaka toka nje akaenda tena akarudi ndani akatoa wengine fresh ku buy time kumbe time yote alikuwa na ngoja ni maliza transaction mimi nikamaliza transaction kachukua pesa nikaziweka vizuri nikaenda kwa gari nikaweka pesa kwa gari ni ule jamaa katoka pia the businessman says for over two weeks after reporting the case police have been unable to trace the suspects who could be operating in a group targeting bank customers making bulk transactions mimi nilikuwa naomba polisi kama wanaanisaidia tuharakishe hii issue and appreciate sana because uh, the longer tunachukua pia unajua kesi inaenda ikiwa week wala wajamaa wanaenda pia wakijipanga probably au jamaa ungeshukua mapema kama ingezekana hata mimi pia ungekuwa umetumia pesa nyingi this year boss in athi river wesley kiprotich has confirmed receiving the report and says preliminary investigations reveal that the vehicle used by the criminals bore fake registration number plates Gatete Njoroge Citizen TV Now the government has intensified efforts to locate two foreign nationals abducted in Moyale, Marsabit County on Monday. Acting Inspector General of Police Gilbert Masengeli and DCI Director Mohamed Amin visited Moyale today that is Thursday to oversee the search at the victims South Korean missionaries David Lee and his mother-in-law Hiwi Sok Chion were forcibly taken from their residence at the Oda Mission Church a secondary school a compound around 9 p.m. The last signals from their phones were traced to double before they were switched off. Kuja kwa sababu tuone vile tutakavyo pata wale walio kwa abducted kwa sababu kuna timu tayari zinaendelea kuwafuata investigation inaendelea tupate kujua vile tutawapata tuwarekeshe familia zao kitu ya pili pia kuna visa mingi zinafanyika hapa za human trafficking drug trafficking na mambo mengine mingi but yote hiyo tumekuja hapa tuhakikishe inakoma kwa wale wa Korea wawili walio kwa abducted bado tunafuatilia hawajapatikana but kuna leads ambazo tunafuata na imani watapatikana na pia tuna appeal kwa wananchi kama kuna mwenye na habari apate kushare na serikali kwa njia moja ama nyingine ili tupate kufanya sababu ni mtu alikuwa hapa yeye hayuko kwa siasa missionary amejenga mashule now the telecredit and radio citizen roadshow entered in its second day in the coastal county county store in Kwale county the roadshow that is celebrating 10 years of existence of telecredit made stops in Kwale town matuga market ukunda town kombani wa ujama and mtongwe Listeners got a chance to learn about how they can easily access loans offered by Tala as they interacted with Radio Citizens presenters Abdi Munai and Pascal Shanga. The roadshow will head to Kilifi on Friday. We are delighted to partner with Radio Citizen and Tala as part of our 10-year celebration. Now we happen to be in Mombasa County, Kilifi County and Kwale County over three days. We are delighted to have a chance to interact with our customers in the coast region. Now when you come across our truck, we'll be giving out merchandise to thank customers for being with us. Equity Bank has contributed 25 million shillings to this year's Kenya Music Festival and committed an additional 100 million shillings over the next four years. The partnership highlights the bank's belief in the role of music and education in transforming lives. During the festival in Eldred, Equity CEO Dr. James Mwangi praised the event for fostering creativity and critical thinking among students, a key element of Kenya's competency-based curriculum. Top performers from the festival will be featured at a state concert at, for President William Ruto showcasing the nation's rich cultural talent. Let me then say the 97, 98 and 99 and the 100 year, four consecutive years we will start with you at a cost of 100 million shillings. We like what you are doing, you are investing in our Kenyan children. A nation that doesn't invest in its young people is busy planning the future. We want to join you in building.
building our nation. At the very beginning, offered us a sum of 10.9 million. The very beginning. That helped, helped us to monitor the festival and do many other things, including certificates, trophies, etc. But even more important to us, sir, that yesterday he made another commitment of 100 million in the next four years. A mixed bag, Kenya's banking industry records increase in total assets, but also the highest levels of non-performing loans you know, to demonstrate growth in 2023. This is according to the latest State of the Banking Industry report, which shows the sector's asset base grew to nearly 8 trillion shillings, even as profits declined. Denis Sotieno reports. The banking industry in the country remains positive and stable despite shocks experienced for a better part of 2023. The Kenya Bankers Association State of Banking Industry Report 2024 shows total sector assets growing by 17.6% to reach 7.7 .7 trillion shillings. The sector's deposits grew by 15.1% to reach 4.5 trillion shillings. This has been enabled by the strategies that banks have actually adopted in terms of uh, mobilization of deposits. So through the mobile and online banking platforms, uh, and as a result of increased deposit mobilization, because banks are in the business of financial intermediation, so converting deposits into loans, we've also seen a very strong asset growth. During the period under review, Loans and advances grew by 15.3% to close at 4.18 trillion shillings. Despite the promising start during the period, asset quality dipped as non-performing loans NPLs rose to 14.8% of gross loans, the highest level since 2007. The stock of NPLs edged upwards to hit 621.3 billion shillings. The banks took caution that uh, they needed to uh, avert a further build-up in NPLs in the market and, of course, uh, to, to prevent that from affecting the stability of the banks, uh, there was increased provisions uh, to, to, to cover for expected credit losses and banks also adopted uh, more robust collection strategies. The report further shows a decline for the industry's total pre-tax profits, which dipped 9.1% to 219.2 billion shillings. Our message to government is that uh, let's work together as private sector and uh, government be able to analyze the bottlenecks that are within the business community so that we can get to resolve them together. The banking industry in the country stands at a critical juncture characterized by both opportunities and challenges. But with over 40 commercial banks, the sector is still highly resilient and players believe they can weather the storm in the second half of the year. Denis Otieno, Citizen TV, Nairobi. Cooperative Bank has posted a 13 billion shilling profit after tax for the first half of the year, representing a 7% growth. The lender saw growth in their deposits by 9.4% to 507 billion shillings in the period under review. The bank notes that the performance is in line with their strategic focus on sustainable growth, resilience and agility. Jimmy Mbogo now takes a closer look at the lender's financial performance for the first half of the year. In the half ending June 30th, 2024, Cooperative Bank saw its customer deposits grow by 9.4% to 507.4 billion shillings. This increment in deposits gave the lender sufficient liquidity to grow their loan book by 2.8% from 365.4 billion shillings in 2023 to 375.6 billion shillings in the first half of 2024. 
The lender noted that over 223,000 have taken out their MSME facility, which saw a cumulative disbursement of 7.5 billion shillings to the SME sector through the mobile credit solution, with the disbursements accounting for 15.9% of the lender's total loan book. These credit disbursements and the bank a return of 23.9 billion shillings in net interest income, registering a growth of 10.7% from 21.5 billion shillings. The lender further registered an increase in their operating cost, which grew by 11.1% from 19.1 billion shillings to 21.3 billion shillings in the period under review, while their total assets also grew by 7.8% to close the half at 716.9 billion shillings, up from 664.9 billion shillings previously. At the same time, in the period under review, Cooperative Bank Assurance Subsidiary registered a pre-tax profit of 682.7 million shillings with the bank subsidiary which focuses on MSME clients, Kingdom Bank, making a profit before tax of 635.5 million shillings. Jimmy Mbogo, Citizen TV, Nairobi. Kenya's push towards sustainable transportation has received a significant boost with a $10 million loan from the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation to e-mobility company Basigo. This investment is set to expand Basigo's electric bus fleet, solidifying the nation's position as a leader in green mobility in Africa. Jasmine Omboy reports. With over 500 reservations from bus operators in Nairobi and an additional 300 from Kigali, the $10 million loan from the Development Finance Corporation, DFC, is a shot in the arm for Basigo. This financing package is expected to create a surge in production, creating 300 green manufacturing jobs at Kenya vehicle manufacturers, contributing to Kenya's green industrialization efforts. Uh, we are currently producing, proud to produce, in partnership with Kenya Vehicle Manufacturers, five vehicles per month. Uh, our goal is to be raising that to 20 vehicles per month uh, in the coming months, with the overall aim of delivering 1,000 electric buses here in Kenya in the next three years. During a visit to the Kenya Vehicle Manufacturers Plant in Thika, where Basigo is assembling its electric buses, U.S. Ambassador to Kenya Meg Whitman has underscored the importance of the partnership between the U.S. and Kenya in advancing green industrialization. Very excited about EVs. I mean, EVs are the future of I think Africa and the world um, and green industrialization and green jobs have got to be a big part of Kenya's uh, growth and um, generation of, of good jobs. So we're doing everything we can to be helpful and relying on great entrepreneurs and uh, great manufacturing technicians and uh, companies and of course the financing arm of the U.S. government which is DFC. This investment is part of a larger $250 million financing package announced during President Ruto's visit to the U.S. aimed at boosting Boosting Kenya's e mobility sector and supporting the country's broader development goals. Why we're interested in this sector is we think it has the potential for sustainable growth, for job creation, for better movement of people. I mean, how great is it to be on a bus that's not super noisy, that doesn't have, it's not emitting black smoke? I mean, we think this is improving the quality of life for Kenyans, and that's our mission as the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation to finance projects that improve people's lives. Early adopters of Basigo's electric buses include operators such as City Hopper, Supermetro, Embasava, Metrotrans, and the Kenya Bus Services, KBS. Jasmine Wamboi, Citizen TV. Now, Kenya Development Corporation has launched a 2 billion shilling credit support for small and medium enterprises. The SME fund is in partnership with the India Export Import Bank. The fund is designed to empower Kenyan businesses through favorable financial terms for acquiring technology, machinery and equipment from India. It is aimed at accelerating Kenya's industrial modernization, enhancing competitiveness and creating sustainable, sustainable economic growth. According to Kennedy Wanderi, the acting director of corporate services, Kenya is committed to fostering investment and technological transfer through strategic partnerships. He says the terms are friendly with the interest rates at single-digit figures, which is half the prevailing commercial rates in Kenyan banks. The government also committed to ensure timely approval of tax exemptions and provide the necessary support for the seamless implementation of the loan facility. 
Good morning. I'm so very glad that you are all here. We are all your partners. We would like to access this facility to more customers. Uh, we have to date advanced about uh, half a billion Kenyan shillings. Uh, the facility is uh, uh, 15 million US dollars, so we still have uh, uh, some facility not taken up, uh, and that's why we are reaching out to uh, you know our potential customers. And we believe the manufacturers uh, are the main beneficiaries of this uh, facility. Uh, we held a forum with the Kenya Association of Manufacturers uh, uh, and uh, basically to you know give them more information uh, about this facility and how they can uh, benefit uh, from this facility. So we've partnered uh, with the uh, Exim Bank of India itself uh, to come on also and explain how uh, you know customers can go about uh, you know applying for this facility. And finally, in business, Prime Cabinet Secretary Musala Mudavadi has called on professionals in the supply chain and procurement sector to review the laws and regulations to improve efficiency on allocation of resources and cut wasteful expenditure. Speaking in Mombasa, the official launch of this year's annual Heads of Supply Chain and Procurement meeting, Mudavadi says the government plans to digitize 80% of critical government services and limit human interactions. He says over 600 billion shillings is lost annually to corruption representing 7.8 percent of the GDP. For speakers and participants and we thank you very much for your I hope we are happy to be here. Kenya Institute of Supply is the organization for Mr. You can help improve the situation and safeguard the livelihoods of our people, particularly if you embrace the technological advances driving your industry, including artificial intelligence, blockchain, and cloud computing. Ideally, you should be helping to ease the pain of the government by ensuring that all procurement processes deliver value for money for the people. We need to develop and use tools to improve procurement procedures, reduce duplication, and achieve greater value for money, including centralized procurement through our supplies branch for common use items, leverage economies of scale, framework agreements. This uh, digitization, Your Excellency, is envisaged to create so much value to this country in terms of efficiency, in terms of increased transparency, in terms of greater accountability and visibility of all our procurement processes.